comedian Bob Newhart was always a master at his craft. One skill he learned deliberately was the ability to stammer and use verbal fillers to augment his delivery. I wondered if the night that King Kong climbed the outside of the Empire State Building was also the first night for a new guard. Uh, uh, Mr. Hennessy? Yeah. Yes, uh, sir, I hate, to, uh, hate to bother you at home like this, but uh, yes, uh, so, uh, something's come up and, and it, isn't, it isn't covered in the guard's manual. I, I, looked, I looked in the index yesterday. I, I, looked, uh, I looked under unauthorized personnel and, uh, and pe uh, people without passes and, uh, and, uh, and apes and, and apes' toes. Once, while recording his sitcom The Bob Newhart Show, a producer asked him, uh, would you mind not stammering so much? Newhart replied, mm, that stammer built a house in Beverly Hills. Early in his career while recording, an audio engineer heard the ums and uhs and long pauses and cut them out. Newhart told him, you're screwing with the formula, put those back in. Today on Stories and Strategies, ums and ahs. Take those out or leave those in. My name is Doug Downs. Music off the top. The theme to the Bob Newhart Show, which had a name, actually. Home to Emily. Composed by Lorenzo Music and Henrietta Music. Just as we get started, I want to thank Sandor Timar. Sandor is the CEO of Aquila PR in Tokyo, Japan. And Sandor recently gave us, Stories and Strategies, a nice shout out on his LinkedIn channel. Generated some good response. Thank you, Sandor. My guest this week is linguistics professor at the University of Sydney in Australia, Nick Enfield. Hi, Nick. Hi, how are you? Uh, good. Uh, Mid-20s today, I think, in Sydney, but y you've actually had cooler weather this summer, haven't you? Not, not as hot as, as usual. That's what I've been reading. Yeah, that's right. So it is, um, well, funny old weather, as I think everybody tends to comment all around mm. the world. So it's, mm. been, uh, it's been cooler and it's a bit of a relief to the overly hot summers we have, but still a little bit unnerving too. Yes, in the the bigger scheme of things. Fewer wildfires, but in the bigger scheme, that is that is uh, concerning. True. Um, Nick, you're also a co-director of the Sydney Centre for Language Research. You have your PhD in linguistics from the University of Melbourne. You've written, just by my count, I counted 18 books, but math was not my strong suit, <laughs> books on language, linguistics, and human sociality. The full library of them is available through your website, which is in the show notes to this podcast. You were awarded the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Outstanding Research from the University of Sydney. You're a fellow at the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, as well as the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Australian Academy of Humanities. And you've written for a lot of newspapers, The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, The Wall Street Journal and Science. It's great to have you on the podcast, Nick. Thank you very much for having me. First, your book. I'm not quite done, um, but I'm most of the way now. How We Talk is extraordinary. So and I think where we should start the conversation is the conversation machine. What do you mean by that? And I, I think it sort of sets the context um, for the rest of what we're going to talk about. Well, The Conversation Machine is actually the original title that I wanted to give that book. Uh, it's called How We Talk after, you know, books that are intended for broader audiences end up being retitled at the last minute thanks to boardroom conversations with publishers. And, and my original title was The Conversation Machine, which is really the concept at the core of the book. So language uh, is this unique thing. Humans have it. It's elaborated in these wonderful ways around the world and linguists try to understand what do all humans share that allows us to, to learn language and to l use language in the way that we do. And this book is really my answer to that question and the answer being, well, we have something called the conversation machine and that is a combination of aspects of our psychology, aspects of our mind, aspects of our social 
uh, instincts, if you like, and also aspects of our social organization that all kind of conspire to allow us to use language in the way that we do. And my argument is that you only really see that when you examine how we talk, when you look at free-flowing conversation, linguistics and the study of language have not tended to really focus on that. It's a field that is focused, uh, I guess, traditionally on written language and on more formal forms of language. And so we learn new things and different things when we look at the messiness of real human conversation. And what I and, and my colleagues find is that messy human conversation opens up new understandings of what it means to be a, a linguistic animal. And the idea of the conversation machine is that there is a cadence or a flow or dare I say a type of dance that's executed between the two speakers and the two listeners or more involved in a conversation. And if one is out of step or out of kilter or out of cadence, it can throw the other one off, either the speaker or the listener. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. It's certainly an important component of the idea. So I suppose that the key concept that, that captures what you just said is the idea that conversation is a, a, a form of collaboration, a form of cooperation. And so when we think about language, we it's very easy to think about monologue and to think of, for example, you, you know, you, you, you read somebody's speech or you read a news article or something and, uh, you know, there's, there's one voice. Uh, even if you read a novel, you have obviously dialogue within the novel, but, the, you know, this is all coming from, um, from, from one author. But when you get into a conversation, you have two people who it's as if they've kind of got into a vehicle together. Um, but there isn't one driver, you know, they're alternating between the role of driving and, and being a passenger in some sense, but they're, they're each participating. They each have to play a role to collaboratively move this thing forward, which we, which we want to call a conversation. So one of the really kind of important ideas about what we learn from language by looking at conversation is that even whether you're a speaker or a listener, you're playing a role. You have a certain degree of accountability for, for that role and, and you're, you're contributing in a sense to a, to a collaborative enterprise to get through the conversation to a, a place where you both want to go. And ums and ahs, which I'll call verbal fillers, I've heard the term used, um, you might call them traffic signals, which from what I'm reading in your book, serve purposes for both the speaker and the listener. Yeah, that's right. So arms and ahs are very widely disparaged. If you go online and look for advice for public speaking, if you go to a workshop and look for advice on public speaking or you learn how to present in front of people, do media interviews, these are the things that probably one of the first things you'll get told is get rid of these arms and ahs. That, you know, they all the time, Nick, all the time as an editor, all the time. They must go. So you certainly wouldn't add them if you were writing something, okay? But you have, uh, let's say, disfluency when you're writing something. You might pause, you might scribble something out and then kind of rewrite it. And when you read my written work, you don't see all those stops and starts and reformulations and so on. But in conversation and interaction, it's a real-time process. It's unfolding. What you're hearing is happening at the same time as I'm producing it. So I don't get time to polish it. I don't get time to formulate it perfectly. And so nobody's perfect. Language is very demanding. It's going by very quickly. So, you know, there's very few people who can speak perfectly with never an error and, you know, never... Uh, any doubt about which word they want to choose next. So these words like um and are and hesitation markers and, and so forth help to deal with this because what they do is, let's say I am speaking to you, I'm searching for a word and I haven't finished what I want to say. Well, I could just go silent as my mental machinery is kind of ticking over, but you wouldn't really know what was happening, okay? You wouldn't know, am I finished or what's happening? Is he still going to say some more? So things like um and ah serve as what I call traffic signals in that context because they're saying, wait, I'm not done. 
there's more to come. Now, seen that way, you can say, well, they're very uh, functional and, and they're cooperative because what they do is they allow you to then wait without uh, worrying that you've missed your cue to start talking. So they're, they're really quite useful in terms of organizing the conversation and the back and forth between people. The problem with them, of course, is that they reveal that you're having trouble formulating what you want to say. And sometimes that's just not a problem. When you're with friends, you're talking on the fly. I think the thing about public speaking is that you're supposed to know exactly what you want to say. You're supposed to be well rehearsed. You're supposed to be able to deliver what you want to say without sort of revealing that you're having any trouble with that. And that's why there is a, a, an effect of using too many ums and ahs in public speaking. People in the audience are much more sensitive to it in those formal settings than they are if you're just having a face-to-face -face conversation with them. So I get the benefit for the speaker then of the traffic signal that um, instead of leaving silence, I'm sort of holding my place so I can continue with what I want to say. Is there a benefit to the listener though? Are you sending a signal to the listener that um, the next thing I'm about to say is something that needed my careful thought before I said it? Absolutely. I think that's a, a great way of putting it, that it does signal to the listener that there's some extra thought going in here, or it might also signal that there's some hesitation or doubt. So you might be about to deliver a piece of difficult news or something that you expect the other person doesn't want to hear so much. Uh, sometimes it's not that negative. So we find in studies of telephone calls uh, back in the day when people used the telephone a bit more exclusively than they now do, there was a, a, a very regular pattern that you would find if you listen to t telephone calls and people would open the call with a bit of greetings, you know, hi, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? A little bit of small talk. And then the caller would say, um, and then whatever followed would be the reason for the call, why they're calling. Right. And so that's a really, it's a really interesting puzzle as to why um came to have that very specific function in phone calls. But what a clear, you know, because you can see that it had that function, it meant that for the listener, it was indeed a very useful signal because it, it set off this alert. Oh, okay, now we're done with the sort of preliminaries. Now we're getting down to the business of the call. I've got to pay a bit better attention. And so the, the use of the um is quite well fitted to that because the um says to the other person, okay, there's something coming up where I have to pay a slightly better attention or, or sort of concentrate a bit to try to piece together what's, what's, what's coming with what just came before. And uh, that would be an example of, of how it's useful for the listener. At Stories and Strategies, we make podcasts for clients anywhere in the world, including Australia. How popular have podcasts become down under? Well, 37% of the Australian population, 12 and up, listens to at least one podcast every month. 37%. Okay, some quick math. 37% of the Aussie population over 12 is 7.7 .7 million people. There are 6 million Netflix subscribers in Australia. There are more podcast listeners in Australia than Netflix subscribers. Maybe a podcast is right for you or your organization. Want to talk about it? Send me an email personally, doug at storiesandstrategies.ca, and we'll set something up. We'll talk podcasts and maybe swap some Netflix ideas. In your book, you, you say there are some 6,000 languages and dialects in the world, and I'm sure that's expanding. Um, all, um all the time. Is there a single language in, across the face of the earth where um, uh, like, so, some of these verbal fillers, where there's no word for those? Or do these verbal fillers exist in all 6,000 languages? Well, I would bet a large sum of money that you would never find a language that lacked these kinds of signals. Uh, it's hard to, I, I mean, I can't prove it because this is an interesting problem. I, Linguists study languages of the world, and as you say, there are thousands of them. The problem is that it, you don't have really good quality data about all 
of the thousands of languages of the world. And if you do have some data, oftentimes it's not going to be data about the kind of messy context of everyday interaction. It's more going to be, uh, you know, written and sort of more formalized. And so sometimes you can go to the library, try to get information about a language and, and come up short with information about this particular aspect of language. But where we have got data and where we've looked, which is in dozens and dozens of languages from very, you know, every corner of the world, really, you immediately find these things. All you have to do is, is get a tape recording of people who are having a natural conversation around their, their home or their village. And immediately you'll begin to hear these ums and ahs. You'll be, you'll hear words like, huh? Uh, these kinds of organizational interjections that, that, that people need to use. And that's simply because everywhere you go, people converse. They engage in this cooperative form of communication. And everywhere you go, they are needing to signal their kind of participation, what they're doing at the moment. Am I? still holding the floor? Am I yielding the floor to you? These forms of cooperative communication, as far as we know, are universal among human groups. So they have purpose. I want to play for you a clip from Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Uh, most Canadians will already know which one. Uh, he's being asked what his family is doing to cut back on the usage of plastics to help the environment. What do you and your family do to cut back on plastics? Uh, we uh, uh, we have uh, recently switched to drinking uh, water bottles out of uh, water out of uh, when we have water bottles uh, out of a uh, plastic uh, sorry away from plastic towards uh, paper um, like drink box water bottles sort of things. There's there's a number. <laughs> well, it's a great example of what we would call disfluency in uh, in technical terms. Uh, I think that it's a very good example of a case where you would assume he hasn't prepared, his mind is on something else, and as I was saying earlier on, if you're in a conversation that's completely informal with close friends, that's how it is. We don't prepare for everything we're going to say. We don't rehearse the things we're going to say. But when you're the prime minister and you're in front of television cameras and you're talking about policy and practice... It's expected that you've thought about what you're talking about and that you have things straight in your mind. So disfluency really doesn't give you the sense that you have things straight in your mind. And so this was certainly a, a, a bad error for him from a kind of performance point of view. You know, as a, as a, as a politician, um, you are performing and you need to give people the you need to reassure people that you, you know what you're talking about, you're committed to your ideas and you're clear in your mind. And so it's a it's pretty hard for him, I think, in that context to argue that he was clear in his mind if he was unable to deliver a pretty simple sounding message in yeah. his in his linguistic performance. He did win the election. So, you know, that I come back to so how harmful are these? If you have a few ums and ahs, first of all, they may have purpose. Are, are they all that harmful and should be, you be working to edit all of them out as Toastmasters and some of the others seem to want you to? I don't think that you'd call them harmful. I know that people sometimes find them annoying. I mean, my stance about this is, is the same as my general stance about languages, and that is that you need to use it mindfully. So you need to be aware of the words that you're choosing formulations that you're using, the habits that you have, you need to have some kind of heightened awareness and pay attention to the effects that language has and then use it strategically with that awareness. And so sometimes you find that an arm or an R well-placed has a useful function and sometimes you want to exploit that and other times it's too much or it's distracting or it's off-putting for your audience and you want to avoid that. So I think the key is being more conscious and more mindful about the effects that language has on others and then making decisions accordingly. Last question while I have you. Uh, the term conversational overlapping. And the idea is when someone is talking, if it's your habit to say, mm, mm-hmm, right, yeah, mm, right. And I, as a, as a podcast producer, I hear some people who have that approach 
And I've always worked to try to help strip them, strip that out. The idea that it's distracting for the speaker. I might be wrong. Conversational overlapping in the right context and the right mindfulness has valuable usage. Absolutely. So it's a very important feature of certain aspects of language that you do need to hear from your listener that kind of feedback. So in the book, How We Talk, I cite a study by Janet Bavilis and her colleagues, which looks at people telling narratives to other people. They're actually talking about near-death experiences that they've had. So they're little kind of stories. I'll tell you about what happened to me at this time in the past. And the listeners will naturally be saying things like, "Uh uh-huh, mm-hmm, oh, wow, Mm -hmm. these kinds of little interjections through the course of the story. And when they studied these interjections, they found that they were carefully timed and they would occur at certain points that would match in a way the progression of the narrative that was being told and then they would also match with the conclusion of the narrative and and, and sort of the whole thing would land well if the listener was giving the right kind of feedback. And in the experiment, they distracted the listeners with a certain kind of task. So, for example, the listener was told, unbeknownst to the storyteller, that they had to monitor for any time the storyteller told uh, used a word uh, that started with the letter T. (laughs) And they have to press a little button under the desk every time this happened. So it completely distracted them from actually following the content of the story. So they were uh, producing many fewer uh uh-huhs. They were not paying attention to this story, so they didn't know when they were supposed to say, wow, oh, my God. And what happened was that the storytellers' stories kind of fell apart. They became much less fluent and much less able to stitch their story together and to kind of make it land well. And it was a very good illustration of how speakers are not just speaking into a void. You you have a listener and the listener has a part to play. So they've got to show that they're paying attention, that they're interested in what you're saying. And so that would be an example of, of something you might call conversational overlapping that shows some affiliation and some interest in what you're saying. And that is, I think, a really good illustration of this conversation machine idea that two or more people are really playing roles, complementary roles in language usage, and it's, it's, it's never really a monologue. I loved the book. It's How We Talk. It's one of the 18 18- uh, on your website, the website link is in the show notes to the podcast. I read, uh, probably half the book. Nick sent it to me about four in the clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, my time. And I, I had read half the book by about nine o'clock that evening. Um, just completely stole my day. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. It's completely stole the rest of my day and I'll, I'll finish, but it is, I read a lot of these and this one is particularly good. So, and, and thank you for being on the podcast today. Thanks very much for having me. If you'd like to send a message to my guest, Professor Nick Enfield, his email is also in the show notes. Stories and Strategies is a co-production of JGR Communications and Stories and Strategies podcasts. Um, You know what would help? If you could leave a rating for this podcast in your podcast app, it sends a signal to other listeners uh, that this is a podcast worth listening to. And thank you for listening.